Okay. Let's see. Maybe you should turn on off some lights. I just need to log in here, I think. Uh, we start with this exercise tree today, which uh, according to the plan, and it was uh, lot sizing, so let me just wait for the system to get up here, yeah. Let me try again. You probably know my password anyway, no? <laughs> <Don't you? laughs> I must change it hope soon, I think. Let's see. Yeah, there we are. So let's start by looking at uh, the exercise text. <coughs> Is this visible? Should we try to extend it slightly? Yeah. Okay. As I said when we discussed this exercise, it's, uh, the numbers are the same as the example in the textbook. The only change is actually that uh, the demand profile here is kind of reshuffled. So uh, basically it should be straightforward to just use the available lingo model and just uh, put the numbers into the right spaces, so to speak. So uh, the first thing, uh, the first question here is just uh, using lingo and find the optimal lot size schedule for this producer. And, uh, the input is given here, as you see, by a, a set of demand numbers, 10 in the future periods. So this is forecasts, and we have a setup cost of 132 and an inventory or storage cost H of 0 0.6 uh, per unit per week. So let's uh, look at the um, solution. Mm, 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 mm. It's here, and that's, as it says here, the simple solution is just to use the finished model, which the, you kind of already have, uh, and not download it from front end and change the forecast, the dem demand profile, to the one given as shown in figure one below here. So the, the only change is basically the, the sequence of these numbers. That's the only difference, and uh, you should end up with this sequence as opposed to the, the, to the original sequence, of course. Apart from that, the model is exactly the same. Uh, and if you would like to kind of write a little bit about the solution, you can, for instance, put it in a table, as I have done in the solution uh, here. And you can observe that uh, there are three setups here, a setup in period one, and then you produce for period one, including two, three, and four. And then you have a new lot size starting in period 5, where we produce 167, which lasts until and uh, after period 8, and you have the final setup in period 9, where we produce 188, which covers the last two periods. The objective value here, or the, the actual total cost of this, this uh, plan, uh, turns out to be 717. Uh, it has been uh, calculated down here, I think. Yeah, you can see here that we have kind of put up the optimal inventory found uh, from the solution. You can't actually see it here, but you see the value here, 717. So just to check that it's correct, I've, I've actually manually calculated here by, by taking uh, 
the setup cost 132 multiplied by three there were three setups and then I just add together all the inventory volumes and multiply by 0 0.6 and that turns out to produce 717 here which is of course cor in correspondence with the, the solution from the, the, the lingo mode. So this was uh, question A, simply realizing that the numbers were the same as the model you had and then be sure that you put in the demand profile on the correct place basically just a reschedule of, uh, of the original model. Now if you re return to the text in question B it's uh, you're given the task of uh, kind of finding an alternative production plan by using the silver mill heuristic so it's just kind of exercise in conducting this silver mill heuristic. Of course then you know you need to know how to do that and it's described in the textbook as well as in lectures so it's, it should be relatively straightforward. You, you calculate the average cost starting in period one and then you produce for the first period that, that produces a cost of 132 then you have a setup of course and if you produce for two periods of course you still have the setup but then you have some inventory which you have to produce in period one which kind of carries over to period two. So uh, then you got another average cost, then you produced, you get 132 plus the, the storage cost of 0 0.6 times the necessary inventory volume divided by 2. That produces another cost. And then you move on to the third period, same kind of strategy, continuously computing the average cost and then you kind of observe these average costs. And if they decrease, you keep on. At the moment they flip up, you stop. So then you kind of found the local optimum for the average cost and then you use that as information for kind of finding an, an approximate solution to the optimal solution. You can see this in the solution here, you see at stage 1, CO1 is 132 as I said, only a setup, then CO2, meaning that you produce in period 1 to cover both period 1 and period 2, then of course you still get the setup in period 1, you get some storage, 13 is needed to storage to cover the demand there. Divide by 2, then you get 70.2, which is smaller than 132, so you keep on into the third period. Then, of course, you have to produce in period 1 to cover both period 2 and period 3. 132 plus 0 0.6 times 14. Ah, that should be, this, this must be a typo, don't you think so? Should be 13 or 14 on both. I don't... Have you tested this? No, it's... Uh, sorry about this. It's, it should perhaps be 14 here, I think. Not 13, so this is a typo. So it should be the same number here and here, of course, because it's uh, the, the carried over from period 1 into period 2. So it's probably a typo there, sorry about that, it should be 14, not 13. And then, of course, you have to have 26 to cover up for the, 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 the third period, and you have to multiply by 2 there because it's stored over two periods. So um, then it turns out to be 57.2 when you divide by 3, and it's, it's still decreasing. But it turns out that in period 4 here, you get 57.3, so it's a very small increase, but you, you keep to your algorithm scheme here and then stop at period 3. And then you kind of just, if you look at the demand profile here, it should be up here somewhere. No, it's not here. We have to go back here. Sorry about this. And then you have kind of decided what to do for the three first periods. So you just kind of remove the three first periods and start again from period 4, doing exactly the same. That is done, uh, uh, done uh, yeah, I was at stage two here. Again, you start the same way, doing only a setup in period four, produces 132 as the setup cost, and then you, from period four, also produce for period five. Of course, you can use four, five, and six here if you find that more. more. Maybe that's a good idea. I, I, the algorithm has its structure kind of skips from one stage to another, kind of zero, zeroing up all these counters here. So of course if you like you can put 4 here instead to kind of say okay I'm at time period 4 if, if that seems more or easier to understand. But the structure is the same and in this case you kind of stop after period 3 
it increases from 68.4 up to 70.2 so then you have then you have settled for the next three periods so you the first three and the next three and now you're suddenly in time period seven keeping on and then you turn out that you only produce for two periods so you have to take the the final stage now to, to kind of look at the two last periods and then you end up with this table here which, which tells us that you should produce in period one for the three first period from period four on for the next three periods from period seven for two periods from period nine for the two last periods so you see you get a different solution here in the optimal solution we produced had four, three setups now we suddenly get four of course the consequence of, of adding more setups is that you reduce the inventory volume of course then you reduce the inventory cost but of course at the same time you increase the setup cost because you move from three up to four so you add one thirty two actually in setup cost for this solution but you as you will see the, the inventory cost is reduced and you, you can do the same thing here as you did in the previous and kind of take up we have the lot size in, in, in line in the, the second line here the actual production schedule and then you can calculate the inventory consequences and of course you can do the same thing as we did in the first case to, to calculate the total cost and in this case it becomes 132 times 4 as it's four setups and then you just add together all these positive numbers here and multiply by 0 0.6 and then it turns out to be 735 so it is slightly higher here not very much uh, it increases from 717 up to 735 so it's a uh, in fact uh, I think I calculated the percentual change here it says that the silver meal deviates only 2.5 percent from the optimal solution so it's it's really not a big change here but recall when we discussed this case in the, the text, we said that this is a kind of special case because there's a, a big spread in the demand here. It's really a very much varying demand. And in that case, the silver and heuristic uh, works very well. It, uh, it's kind of meant to tackle these situations. And in some cases, uh, you will actually get the optimal solution when you use the silver and heuristic, but of course you don't know that. The point of using lingo is that it proves optimality. You're, you're certain that you actually have found the, the cheapest solution. But when you use a heuristic, you, you can't know that. More advanced heuristics can give you information on kind of how far you are from the optimal solution. We, we tend to call these gaps. Okay, so we can have a kind of, kind of interval saying that the solution I have found is, is at least within, let's say, plus minus plus minus one percent from the optimal solution that and then you can run it further on typically to to, to improve on on these solutions but uh, that are there are far far more advanced heuristics than than this one actually okay questions of course this silver and mill heuristic is perhaps not very much used in event planning as you probably understand it's more like a kind of stepping stone for understanding how binary variables work that was the main reason why I kind of included it um, this lot size kind of problem where you kind of have this setup cost and you you keep on repeat re repeated production you can of course think about it in event settings as well that you kind of have to do something on the stage kind of reschedule it or so then and the question is if you can kind of put the artists together in a sequence where you can kind of look at different resets of your, of your equipment and then it could be meaningful but on the other hand in an operational setting it's in those cases it's probably minor costs to save anyway so it's maybe not very relevant from a practical point of view in events on the other hand as I said it's more like a pedagogical concept which we kind of use to to understand stuff okay that was B any questions no questions okay question C assume now that production capacity in any period is limited to a maximal production amount of 100 so now we introduce a constraint here, okay? So you are not allowed to produce more than 100 in each period. Uh, these kind of constraints are typically available, both in classical logistics as well as in events, okay? We might have an, a certain amount of, of chairs, for instance, to, to put audience in. If we have a, 
certain amount of time where we can kind of engage artists and that kind of stuff. So, so these constraints are there, okay? So uh, the day has only 24 hours, so there's a limited amount of concerts you can have in serial. Of course, you can put them in parallel. If you put them in parallel, then they, they tend to cannibalize audience, as we say, okay? Because if you have a very large festival, which have many parallel sessions, okay, of course, then you, you get typically get uh, a, a small amount of audience on each of these parallels, okay? So, so these kind of things are things you, you must take in into consideration when you, when you arrange and plan events, definitely. Of course, these kind of problems, they tend to be more relevant when an event is big. Okay? If you have a big event, of course, then you... And if you have a limited time, then you have to have parallel sessions like in a congress, okay? And, uh, but those of us who have been to many congresses, which are very large, uh, tend to know that the number of, of audience on each parallel may tend to be small, of course, when there are many parallels. So, uh, so th there's a kind of trade-off you, you have to take into consideration. Of course, in those cases, it doesn't matter from a financial point of view, because you already paid the ticket, so how many audience are on each concert doesn't really matter from the money point of view. On the other hand, it could matter from the the feeling of the audience and their willingness to return and that kind of stuff, okay? So it has implications on at least long-term finances. So what changes does this piece of information induce on the optimal solution from A? Of course, if we, we look at the optimal solution from A, it was given up uh, here, wasn't it? And you see that uh, the optimal solution from A induces three production points. The first one is okay, then you produce only 84, that's allowed. But the two last ones are not allowed, okay? You produce 167, which is more than 100. The same with 188, which also is more than 100. So you would expect now, by introducing these new constraints, that you must change your optimal solution. It will have impact on the optim optimal solution, and of course, it should have negative impact. Because this is the cheapest you can do. And if this is, is not allowed, of course, it will be more expensive. That's kind of obvious, isn't it? So you would expect that the production schedule must change. You're not allowed to have these numbers anymore. You must probably have more setups to be able to do this. That seems relevant. And you must have uh, numbers at least not larger than 100. And that should have an impact on the total cost, which should rise from 717 up to some higher number. And of course, uh, <coughs> the, the solution here is evident. You, you just introduce these constraints into the lingo model. You change it, you put into new constraints, and you rerun it and see what's happening. That's kind of what's meant by this exercise. So if you, if you look a bit further down in the solution here, we will see that that has been done. New constraints on production quantities of the form xt less than or equal to rt, where these rt is 100 in this case, okay? So these rt is just one way of writing uh, a typical constraint. There are then typically is an abbreviation for resource, okay? So we have some kind of resources here which we have to stick to. And if you, again, I kind of took up, uh, rewritten the optimal solution here, and you see that uh, it's the same as before. So what we need to do now is to do a change in lingo uh, of this form. Okay, we just say that x1 should be smaller than or equal to 100, the same for x2 and all possible x's. In that case, we have introduced this new set of constraints, so we have to add this to the end or whatever point in the model we like, basically. <laughs> yeah, of course, you, you can do this generally if you like. Here's a general version of these kind of constraints, okay, where we add production constraint resources as a new constraint in the kind of basic model we, we started with when we, when we formulated this. Now if you do this, uh, I don't think, I know, I don't remember if I, no, I didn't. I didn't put up the actual model here, but I think it's on front there. Let's have a look. If we go up here and go down here to solutions, I think I actually put in this model, lot size 2. I think this one, let me just download it uh, to the desktop. And let's have a look at it. The 
that's this one and then I have to open up this uh, lingo kind of thing uh, computer M so let me open this new model which includes the constraints so you can see that it looks the way I told you it should look so you see this first part is the original model and then I just add this new set of constraints the rest is exactly the same and uh, of course now we can run it here if you like of course we get the solution and if you look at the axis here you see that all axes are now less than or equal to 100 you start in period 1 producing 84 and then you move to period 5 to produce 80 to 7, 87, 9, 88 and 10, 100 so you move from three, two, one, two, three, four, five setups actually in this case to be able to handle the demand when you're not allowed to produce more than a hundred uh, this should be here somewhere, yes uh, this is the actual solution which Lingo produces of course then you can calculate the corresponding inventory numbers they are again relatively small but of course the main change in cost here comes from the fact that you have to move from three up, up to five setups and uh, the optimal cost here which you can find in Lingo as well is one eight one sixteen point six which ki is kind of a substantial change here uh, it's thirteen point eight percent or thirteen point nine more or less approximately increase in cost you move from seven seventeen up to eight sixteen almost a uh, change in hundred so you see by um, adding constraints it's, it's really not what you like okay? that, that produces both more complex models to solve as well as worse solutions and of course that is the reason why everybody would like to have kind of free competition in a sense uh, you, you would like to kind of have situations where you can produce freely then you are able to allocate your resources most efficiently but uh, unfortunately, or fortunately, if you want to deal with these matters, uh, this is the world. Okay? There is constraints, so we have to take them into consideration. In Norway, we have a, a law, for instance, that says that you're not allowed to work too many hours about these 40 each week and uh, this kind of stuff. Okay? And uh, this has great implications on, on the total cost of the Norwegian work system. Not only in traditional log logistics, but also, also in events. Uh, you cannot kind of keep people working 24 hours a night. Uh, and you might like to do that in certain events, okay? That's, uh, that's uh, more kind of how it works. But uh, in Norway this is not allowed. So then you have to take that into consideration. That uh, produces grave changes in what you really would like to do. Okay. Now, what would happen if this maximal production amount is smaller than 43.9 units? Again, of course, you can do this. You can put in a number instead of 100 now to, let's say, 43.8 and see what's happening. And uh, if you do that, you get this kind of output. So if you change 100 from 100 down to, you have the model now, you just put in a, a number less than 43.9, then you get no feasible solution found. This means that there is no solution to the model. Uh, meaning that uh, the feasible space, which we kind of draw in an example here, do you remember? It was kind of, it looked something like uh, this, didn't it? We had some straight lines here and this was kind of where we were allowed to be. And you get this output, you have kind of cramped it so that there is no points left. It's kind of empty, okay? That's what this means. And the reason is evident here, isn't it? Because if you add all the mount together, you end up with 4, 3, 9. Okay? That is the total demand you have to cover. And if you divide by 10, you get 43.9, which is the average demand per period. And if you impose a constraint, you're not able to produce average demand per period. Of course, then you can't cover all the demand either, can you? So that is the reason why you get an infeasible solution here. 
if you run into s these kind of problems, basically what it means is that you have kind of misspecified your model, isn't it? You have some kind of resources which, so either you don't understand what you do, or you made an error, basically, because uh, if you are sensible, of course, you should plan for a situation where you basically have enough resources to cover what you should do, okay? So, but uh, this could be kind of come up from time to time when you kind of misspecify your model. You, you, you have too tight constraints or you have too sparse amount of resources. And that might, might happen when you actually do this on kind of in a computerized setting. Of course, in practice, it, if it happens, in practice, it means that you cannot, I cannot run this event, okay? <laughs> that's what it means. And it may be that you, you observe that as you move along. And that's, good, that's very bad, isn't it? It's kind of good to know before you start <coughs> that it's actually it's possible to do it. Okay. So if you run into this, it's a kind of strong signal that uh, something must be done. Okay. It says here that the reason for the term unexpected is, of course, that this model response is not so unexpected after all. If you compute, as I said, the total demand here and divide by 10, then of course you get 43.9 in that must be present to be able to solve the problem. But we could, put, we could, could find a lot of constraints here which, which would produce infeasibility. If you look at uh, the demand profile, you can see here, uh, to, you can find many cases, can't you? Uh, uh, I have to go at the top then again. Uh, all the way. Ah, I have to go back here, actually. <laughs> of course, if you can't produce more than 11 in the first period, then that doesn't work, does it? If you can't produce more than 13 in the second period, still it don't work. So any number constraint below all these numbers would produce an infeasible solution. And all kind of aggregate problems as well. If in the first two periods, you, you have to be able to produce 26, don't you? If not, it won't work as a total. So if you have a, a kind of total constraint, uh, the average should be below 25, it doesn't work. So there's a lot of possibilities here to produce infeasibilities. But it's always a good idea to understand this kind of thing, because it, when it pops up, then you know what it's, what, what's happening. Okay, what was the final question here? Was, was there some more questions? Yes, I think it was. Uh, 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 maybe we should go on the text. Yeah, this was D, now let's move to E. Suppose now that the producer produces more than one product with unlimited production capacity. So we kind of remove this constraint now. We can produce as much as we like, so we don't need to bother with that. Okay? But now we change the situation from a situation from a single product to many products. Discuss how the producer can solve his extended lot size problems in such a situation. Uh, what I would like you to answer then is, of course, of course, we can kind of attack this by using the same method we have already learned by kind of producing or mod mod modeling a new model, where we, of course, we'll have to do something. We'll have to introduce some more subscripts to, 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 to introduce that, for instance, this xt must be substituted with another subscript telling us which products we are kind of producing. But uh, what I'm really aiming for is to, for you to realize that if there is no limitations on production capacity, then the producer can kind, kind of solve this problem by just repeatedly solving single product lot size problems. Okay, you can take one product, solve that, in the same way, take the other, solve that, because there's nothing linking these products. There's no production capacity limiting you. So you might as well just repeat the same structure as you already have. That is the idea. And the reason is, of course, that uh, as long as there is nothing kind of binding the products together, then, of course, you, can, you are free to produce it as you like, basically. And it would be optimal for you, cheapest, uh, just to, to solve a repeated set of lot size problems. And you can solve them one by one, if you like, or spread them uh, on different computers, if that's what you like. Do it in parallel, no problem. So it doesn't really impose any new situation at all. You can kind of decompose this new problem into sub-problems where each problem is a single item, lot size problem. And this is the kind of thing we use when we develop new algorithms for this problem. Okay? If we 
if we have constraints which bind, then we cannot remove them and kind of pretend that we can solve it one by one. And then we solve it one by one, and then we use that information to kind of check if, if the constraint is very heavily overridden, and then we kind of do some tricks to kind of move into a situation where we can kind of move from the original solution into a solution which actually is feasible in the end. And of course then, given that you understand E, then you should understand F as well, because now we introduce something with limits here. And then we cannot do it like that. Then we kind of have to look at the full specified model, which actually contains reality. And we have to solve that model by itself. Uh, so if you look at the solution here, uh, <coughs> let's move on to the last two questions. It says in E that the description in the exercise should tell us that we lo now look at a situation where the producer produces more than one product, not a very uncommon practical situation, by the way. A simple answer would then be to reformulate the model of equations 49, longer up there, to account for more than one product. Note that equation 6 must be removed as the exercise text explicitly states unlimited production capacity. What I mean by this is, of course, I'm referring to the model here. You just have to introduce new subscript for this multitude of products, and of course then you could have a different setup cost for each product. Typically you would have that. You would typically have different inventory costs, because it would be typically be different value of the products. And you will typically have different production costs. So you cannot just change this x, you'd have to change the c, and the i, and the h, and the k, and the delta. Okay, so every kind of input here would have to have a new dimension. We will see this later on. Okay? But I also said you have to remove this one, okay, because there is no constraint on the production cap, so you take down on that one out and just do this kind of change. Uh, the interesting part kind of comes up when you have a capacity constraint, as kind of has been introduced in sub-question F here. And then you have to decide how to take care of this one. Uh, here I have actually formulated a new model where there is no capacity constraints. You see I have introduced, as I said, a new index. I use J here, not I as I do there. J is a product index, index here. And I have T here. So the, that, that one has been extended, that one, that one, that one, that one, that one. Of course, these ones are basically the same now. There's no change. Only change is to add a new subscript to, to account for fact. And uh, as long as it is like this, it's kind of obvious if you're kind of good in mathematics here to, to accept that this can kind of be partitioned into some problems and solved one by one. It could, it could be done just as easily, uh, logically. But the, the big change comes in the next question. Because then you are told to introduce a capacity constraint. Of course, I, I discussed this briefly when we discussed the, the exercises. I said, I said you could, for instance, do it like this. And this is the standard way of doing it. So you kind of add some kind of resource cons consumption for each of the products. So when I produce a certain amount of a certain product in a certain period, then I multiply it with a factor which produces res resource usage. Okay? But then I have some limitations on my resource usage. This is, by the way, an error. error. This J should be taken out. Be aware of that, okay? It's, uh, I sum over the J's here, so I, I kind of... I have a common constraint in each period. I have so much hours to use in, on Mondays, and then if I produce a little bit more of one of the products, I, of course I get less to produce on the others. That's kind of what this means, basically. So be aware of that. This is a, a typo. The J should be out. And then you can, of course, Reschedule, re, re, reconstruct your model, or actually just enter this constraint together with all these other constraints in the new model. So you just take these constraints and add it there, and then you have a new model, which must be solved by itself, due to the fact that the products are combined. Of course, you can do this in Lingo or similar type of software, but the problem is that this model solves much, much slower than the single model. It actually is a big leap moving from the simple lot size problem to this one. This one has a name in, in, in uh, mathematical programming. It's called the CLSP model. And CLSP stands for Capacitated Lot Size Problem. Okay, so it's this C which is linked to the 
capacity constraint. So a capacitated lot size problem is a very well studied problem in research literature, which there are proposed hundreds, maybe thousands, maybe tens of thousands of different algorithms to solve. So even relatively small of these ones with, let's say, 40-50 um, products, 40-50 uh, time pairs, turns out to be very hard to solve. Especially if the cost structure is uh, of certain types, and of course, especially if this one is tight, as we say, meaning that you're kind of balancing on the, on the resource uh, possibility set. Of course, in most situations, you will be balancing on this resource capabilities because it will be very expensive to have a lot of overcapacity. Okay, so most factories should be tuned in a way that you are kind of balancing here. So you would expect these production boundaries to be kind of tight. That is kind of how it should be. Everything else would be inefficient in a sense. So uh, you would expect in reality they will that these kind of problems are hard to solve. And uh, kind of the, the logical reason why it becomes so difficult now is the fact that you kind of, if I produce a little bit more of one of the products, I have to kind of take down on So I have to, I'm kind of moving production in a sense. That's kind of what you do here. You kind of, I reduce some of my production in a certain period here and move it to another period to, to compensate. But uh, then I can increase a little bit here. So there's kind of a lot of possibilities opening up in shuffling production from uh, back and forth in time, basically, and, and in between products. So that is kind of the intuitive reason why this becomes tricky to, to kind of solve. So you kind of end up with a kind of, of um, surface you optimize on, optimize on, which goes kind of very much like this spreading along. So you move from one heap, heap to another. Kind of. So it, it's kind of hard to see the difference on these two by kind of looking into the problem. You have to kind of search through it to find it. Okay, that was all, wasn't it? Ideally, now you should be able to formulate these kind of problems by yourself. Okay, if I give you a problem, you write it down in text, you should be able to kind of transform that into a mathematical model. Mathematical model. For instance, something like uh, this part here, okay? But uh, of course, this is kind of challenging if you're not very very much experienced in it. So uh, I don't know kind of how we will do this on the exam. There will be some tests on this. You will see from a previous exam we had that there is some testing on kind of actually changing a model, doing a little bit of tricks on it. Uh, my experience is that students ability to do this is kind of limited. Okay, this, this is not the easiest thing we do to kind of build mathematical models. It's uh, typically a difficult thing. But it's possible to learn it by some experience, by doing it sometimes, then you, you kind of get some feeling for how, how you do this. But uh, I would be lying if I say that, uh, that there is, if, there, if I didn't say that, there's a kind of very big differences in people's heads here. And some people find this very easy, others find it very hard. I don't know about you, okay, whether you find this easy or hard, but uh, we will see on the exam, perhaps, yeah. Uh, one way of giving exams here is, of course, to give a model and ask you to kind of explain it, what it means. That's, that's the simple alternative, okay? The difficult one is kind of just giving a text, formulate a model. And it, it's a very big difference between these two exercises, in my experience. If you give the first one, uh, giving the text, then maybe one of 100 can do it. The other one, you can get uh, 75 or 100 at least. So it will, in most most probably there will be some kind of combination here. We kind of do a little bit of this and a little bit of that. Okay. Questions? No, then we take a break. Okay, then we move into the textbook. The new textbook in the following hour or so today.